So Abu Sufyan, he took a hard and firm stand against Islam. And he, along with his friends and those around him, Quraysh, they tried to stop Islam from spreading. Eventually trying to assassinate the Prophet in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commanded the Prophet to do what? To move, to hide, migrate from Mecca to Yathrib, Medina. After that, Abu Sufyan, did he let go? He did not let go. The second year was the Battle of Badr, the second year after Hijrah, in which Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh, they came and they attacked the Muslims and they were defeated. The next year afterwards in the battle of what? Uhud. What's it, once again, Abu Sufyan and his, his friends and the Quraysh, they came to attack the Muslims. In the battle of Uhud, what happened? The uncle of the Holy Prophet, Hamza, was killed. He was killed. Again, the following year was the battle of what? Ahzab, Khandaq, in which Abu Sufyan went and he collaborated with the Jews in the surrounding areas to siege the Muslims and to attack them, to surround them and to, the, to attack them. And so relentlessly he tried year after year to wage war and to exterminate Islam and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And it continued. But what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was obviously on the side of the Muslims. After every battle and every war, the strength of the Muslims increased. They kept, strength, uh, kept, getting, kept getting stronger and stronger. More people began to adopt this faith. And thus they saw this as a huge threat. Quraysh was not happy with the situation. They thought that by waging war through Abu Sufyan, by waging war against the Prophet, time and time again, they would be able to defeat and destroy the Muslims. But they were not able to. And so they saw the leniency. They saw their weakness as a result of the leniency of Abu Sufyan. They blamed their weakness onto Abu Sufyan. They said, you know what? We need a new commander. Our commander-in-chief isn't doing his job. We need to elect a new president. So they decided to do what? To give authority to, the, to a man by the name of Suhail ibn Amr. And then the sixth year after Hijrah, when the Muslims, they decided to go towards Medina to perform the Umrah with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Suhail ibn Amr and Quraysh, they came and they stopped the Muslims. They did not allow them to enter Mecca. And this is where the Treaty of Hudaybiyah occurred under the supervision from this side of Suhail ibn Amr and on the side of the Muslims, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And they made a treaty. The details of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah are there. This was in the sixth year after Hijrah. And so Quraysh, they saw this as a surrenderance of the Muslims. Yes, we weren't able to allow them to come to Mecca. We made them turn around and go back. And so they, so, so they saw the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as a surrenderance of the Muslims and as a strength to them. But they were absolutely wrong. In fact, history tells us, it is well documented, that even on the side of the Muslims, there were some individuals who considered the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as a weakness and a surrenderance. It is mentioned that the second Khalifa, Umar, he was so agitated by the surrenderance of the Prophet. How could the Prophet surrender? We have, you know, the Muslims and we're so strong and we, are, we, are, we want to go and to perform the Umrah and the Muslims are supposed to be strong and the Prophet is supposed to be a wise and strong commander. How could we surrender to them, to the disbelievers? And so he saw this as a weakness and he went and he complained. The Holy Prophet, he told him, listen, I know what I'm doing. I know how to implement my job. In fact, it has been recorded in the books of history authentically that Umar later on, he said, if there was ever a time in which I had doubt in my heart that this person was truly a prophet of Allah, it was on the day of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. 
So this occurred, this event occurred. And then in the 10th year after Hijrah, which was a sad time for all of the Muslims, and that was when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he left this world. In the end of Safar, in the 10th year after Hijrah, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he died, he left this world. And this initiated a sequence of misfortunate events for the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. It was tough for them before, but after the death of the Prophet, things went in the exact opposite direction. Things changed drastically for the Muslims and the Ahlul Bayt, During the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, who were appointed by a select few to be the leaders of the Muslims, during their time, and especially Umar's time, the Muslims, their empire expanded exponentially. They went and they conquered many different lands under the authority of Umar. And so they made many military, military and material gains. They began to acquire land. They began to acquire money. They began to acquire prosperity and strength, military strength, economic strength. And so this allowed them to boost their personal desires. And this is very dangerous. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, He says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَنْ رَآهُ اسْتَغْنَى The human being can reach a state when he becomes a dictator. There's a Hitler, there's a Stalin, there's a Fir'aun in each and every one of us. But he's under control. We reach a point where we think we are completely independent, we are so powerful, we are so strong because of all that we had, which we have acquired, that we become into a Fir'aun. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَنْ رَآهُ استغنى. We forget that there is an authority, a higher authority. And this is what happened after the death of the Prophet. It boosted the morale of those who considered themselves the leaders of the Muslims. And then in the 23rd year after Hijrah, after Umar died, before his death, days before his death, Umar, he assembled a small group of people, six people, in order to appoint his next successor. Because it was up to him. He was the one that was deciding who would be the successor after the Muslims. He took a group of people, including, of course, by this time, they had to actually, uh, you know, think about Imam Ali also, had to speak to him. Imam Ali was still around. So they appointed a group of people, including Imam Ali and Uthman and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and Talha Zubair, in order to what? To come to a conclusion as to who would be the Khalifa after Umar, the third Khalifa of the Muslims. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he approached Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he told him, listen, you've been nominated, congratulations, you've been nominated to become the Khalifa of the Muslims under two conditions. The first condition is that you abide by the Qur'an. If you abide by the Qur'an, since we are an Islamic nation and our primary source is the Qur'an, you must abide by the Qur'an, number one. And number two, you have to abide by the seerah of whom? Al-Shaykhain. The two shaykhs, meaning Abu Bakr and Umar. If you do this, then congratulations, we now appoint you as the commander of the faithful and you become the Khalifa. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said, listen, as for the Qur'an, the Qur'an, of course. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the talking and walking Qur'an. He himself was the Qur'an. As for the Qur'an, yes. But as for the second condition, absolutely not. If you want, I, I will uh, adopt the seerah of the Prophet. The Qur'an and the seerah of the Prophet. Prophet. And in addition to this, all of the money everything that has been taken unjustly from the people, uh, you know, that which has been used to marry those who were single, buy homes, you know, buy nice horses and camels, jewelry, 
all of that, all of the property that was taken unjustly, I will take it back and give it to its rightful owners. If you accept this, I become Khalifa. And of course, they had just finished huge conquests, acquiring land and material gains. How could this man come and take everything back and distribute it once again? So Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he turned to Uthman. He told him, what about you? You're the next, next in line. What about you? Do you accept these two conditions? Uthman said, yes, sir. And so he was appointed as the Khalifa of the Muslims. Who was Uthman? Uthman, Uthman was the great grandson of Umayyah. And so there was that envy, that poison was still running through the blood of Bani Umayyah. And at this time, Bani Umayyah, it saw it, they saw this was the prime time to capture power. The Prophet is gone, Abu Bakr and Umar are gone. There's a chance that it will go back to Bani Hashim, to Ali ibn Abi Talib, let's take power right now. And so that's what they did. Uthman from Bani Umayyah, he came, he became the Khalifa of the Muslims, and he began to appoint his governors. All of those contemporaries, his contemporaries from Bani Umayyah, they received official posts, including Muawiyah, who was the governor, who was placed as the governor of Syria. Muawiyah was given that, Syria, and they were flooded with an overwhelming amount of resources and money and everything that they needed. Everything was at their disposal. Uthman, he did what he did. Those who were the dearest companions and the most loyal and devout companions, not to the Prophet and not to Imam Ali, but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, Inna akramakum and Allahi atqakum. Those who were the most pious, Uthman, he targeted them. Some were killed, others were tortured. Inshallah, in the upcoming nights, I'll give you a few examples of what happened. And so he did what he did until the year 35 after Hijrah, when the Muslims, they became fed up. What's going on? This is a dynasty. He appointed all of his friends and family members. He's giving them money. There's so much injustice and oppression and things are going wrong. What's going on? They became fed up. So a group of them, they decided to go and to assassinate Uthman. And in the year 35, they killed Uthman. Initially, the blame was placed on whom? Was placed on Ali ibn Abi Talib. Oh, it's Ali. Because they didn't let him become the Khalifa third, he decided to seek revenge after 12 years to kill Uthman so that he could become the Khalifa. But the Muslims knew that this was not the case. So they came running after the death of Uthman. They came running to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They told him now, after 35 years after Hijrah, 25 years after the Prophet, now we want you to become our Imam. Now we want you to become our Khalifa. Imam Ali alayhi salam, initially he told them no. He said, I'm not looking for this position. I'm not looking for power or authority or to conquer lands or uh, you know, to make a buck. This is not my objective. They told him, please, you are seeing the disastrous nature of society, what has happened to our faith, our religion. We need you to fix things. Imam Ali told them, if you allow me to rule over you with justice, then yes. They told him, yes, of course. We want you to become our Imam. And as such, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he officially became the Khalifa of the Muslims. And Muawiyah, who was the governor of Sham, Syria, he felt threatened. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is known for his justice, his own brother from his father and mother, the same blood. He asked the Imam to give him money from Baytul Mal and the Imam said, no, absolutely not. I will not take the money of others and give it to you because you are my brother. No, this is Imam Ali. And so now he is the Khalifa of the Muslims. Things are going to become dangerous and so he felt threatened and used all of his means 
against Imam Ali alayhi salam and the Ahlul Bayt. Until five years, almost five years later, in the year 40 after Hijrah, an assassin was sent on the eve of the 19th of Ramadan into Kufa, where Imam Ali alayhi salam on the eve of the 19th of Ramadan in the year 40 after Hijrah to come and to assassinate Imam Ali alayhi salam and he did so. And as such, Muawiyah was relieved. Now he could be in charge. Yes, there was Al Hassan and there was Al Hussein, but he had power. He had an unlimited amount of resources and he tried everything in his possession and ability to stop the people from turning to the Ahlul Bayt, from seeking the truth. And as such, he began his schemes of propaganda, turning against the Ahlul Bayt, doing everything in his ability. For many years, Muawiyah would make it an obligation upon the speaker, the khatib of the Friday prayers and the Muslims to do what? To curse Ali ibn Abi Talib in public. Your khutbah, your salah is not acceptable. It won't reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless you do what? You give it a little boost. How do you give it a boost? You curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. And if you did not do so, there was a severe punishment for you. And this continued for many, many years. Spreading rumors and lies about the Ahlul Bayt to the point where people began to believe these rumors. They thought that in fact, Ali ibn Abi Talib was a kafir. The Ahlul Bayt, they were kuffar, they were disbelievers. This was the media of Muawiyah. And we know that the media, it shapes the perceptions of people. We know this nowadays. We are very well aware of the strength of the media in shaping perceptions. And this is what Muawiyah did, to the point where people also thought that Ali ibn Abi Talib, they believed that Ali ibn Abi Talib did not pray. This was the rumor that was going around. That Ali ibn Abi Talib did not pray. Ali doesn't pray. Ali who was born in the house of Allah, the only person to ever be born in the house of Allah, and who died in the house of Allah, in between, he didn't have time to pray. So these were the lies and the rumors that were spread about the Ahlul Bayt. And then the time came where Muawiyah faced his doom. Before he died, of course, during this time also, he had dealings with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. There was a treaty between Muawiyah and Imam Hassan that Imam Hassan would take over the Imama after Muawiyah. And there were many reasons. I don't want to get into the specifics of this. This requires a complete lecture by itself. But in the end, Muawiyah was the one who annulled this treaty. He trampled on it. And so before his death, he decided to turn to whom? To his closest, the apple of his eye, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And he told him, listen, you're going to be the Khalifa after me. And if anyone tells you otherwise, you know exactly what to do. And Yazid, he had heard the stories by his father about what had happened in the early years of Islam, what happened to his grandfather Abu Sufyan and the rest of Bani Umayyah, what happened to Uthman, what happened to the rest of them. So he inherited this hatred and animosity from his father Muawiyah. He inherited it from him. Yes, we know that in Islam, people are not blamed for one another's misconduct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish me based on what my father or mother did or what my brother or sister did. But in this case, Yazid, he inherited this hatred from his father. He was taught to hate Islam. He was taught to hate the Prophet. He was taught to hate the Ahlul Bayt. And thus, as a result, in the year 61 after Hijrah, initially after Yazid, he took power. He turned first and foremost to Imam Hussein to receive his pledge of allegiance, his bay'ah from Imam Hussein. 
What did he do? Imam Hussein said, absolutely not. You are asking me for my allegiance? You want me to consider you my leader? You are known to commit adultery, to fornicate, to drink, to, to gamble, to do all of the things that are wrong in public. And you're happy about it, you're proud about it, you announce it. And you expect me to pay allegiance to you and consider you my leader and my imam? Absolutely not. The Quran says, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On that day, the day of judgment, we will call people by whom? By their imams. You want me to be called by your name? They say Yazid and I have to come along behind you? Absolutely not. And so Yazid decided the threat was too big. And he decided to exterminate Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Imam, his final days in the city of Medina. He knew that he had to leave. And you know that when you want to leave that city in which you were born and raised in, you know the place that you're born in, in most cases, and you live in for a while, you have a yearning for that place. There's a special connection that you acquire between that place in which you were born and you were raised in and between yourself. There's a connection, there's a love. Ask your elders, those who have been away from their home countries, they tell you. They tell you there's a yearning for us to go back. There's a love that we have to go back to the place that we were born and raised in. Imam Hussein alayhi salam he was born and raised in the city of Medina. Everything he knows, all of his memories are from the city of Medina. He remembers growing up in the house of whom? In his own house? No. In the house of his dear grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He remembers this. He remembers how his prophet, his dear grandfather would take him in who would hug him, who would kiss him, who would show his affection to him, who would take Imam Hussein and proudly announce him and show his affection in front of all of the Muslims. Hussein remembers, these are his memories from the city of Medina. So as he is leaving, he decides to do what? He knows that he's not returning to the city of Medina. There's no coming back. These are his final moments in this city, the city of his grandfather. So he decides to do what? To go to those who are dearest to him. When you decide to leave somewhere on a journey, what do you do? Who do you go to? You do go to those who are closest to you, your family members and your friends, in order to bid them farewell, to tell them that you are going. Who did Imam Hussein alayhi salam have, who was alive at the time for him to go and bid farewell to? His dear grandfather, Rasulullah, was passed away. His father, Amir al muminin had passed away and in fact he was buried very far away in the land of Kufa. His mother, Fatima al-Zahra, had been killed unjustly and she had passed away. His brother, Al-Hasan, had passed away. He had no one to go to to bid farewell so he decides to go to the grave of his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He goes in the middle of the night he goes towards the grave of his grandfather. He sits there he begins to pray in khushu and sincerity and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he sits by the grave of his grandfather. He places his cheek on the grave of his grandfather. He begins to cry. He remembers all of the memories that he has from his grandfather. He begins to cry and to weep. And as he is crying, he falls asleep and he sees a dream. He sees a dream in which his grandfather Rasulullah is coming towards him, marching towards him with an army of angels on his left and on his right. They are marching towards Imam Hussein. So he tells him, he looks at him, he tells him, are you my grandfather? He says, yeah, yes, yeah, Habibi. He comes towards 
comforts him. He tells him, Habibi Ya Hussein. He brings him forth, he hugs him, and he begins to kiss him. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he begins to complain to his grandfather. He tells him, Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Abatah, my father. The relationship that the Prophet had was that of a father and a son. He considered Hussein his son, and Hussein considered the Prophet his father. He told him, Abatah, I want to complain to you. I want to tell you and express to you all of the horrible things that have been occurring. Ever since your departure, things went poorly. My father, my father was unjustly taken. He was imprisoned and he was dragged in the streets. My mother was killed as a result of her being stuck behind the door. Our house was burned down. Our rights and response, our rights were taken away from us. Everything that we had owned, everyone turned against us. My brother Al Hassan, he was killed. He was poisoned by Muawiyah. And now it is my turn. They have caused a lot of of injustice and mischief he begins to complain to his grandfather his grandfather he holds him close and he weeps he tells him ya habibi ya hussein my dear hussein my son right now your father ali ibn abi talib your mother fatima your brother hassan all of the shuhada your uncle hamza the rest ja'far al-tayyar they have all inhabited and gathered around the heavens and they say ya rasul allah when is Hussein going to come and meet with us? When is Hussein going to come and reunite with us? And as such, we are waiting all impatiently to be reunited with you, oh dear Hussein. Imam Hussein, he weeps. He tells him, my dear grandfather, take me inside the grave with you. I don't want to go back to this life. I want to be taken away. I want to live with you and my family members now. The prophet, he cries and he tells him, my dear son Hussein, there is a a position for you here in heaven that you will only acquire if you go back and reach the station of Shahada. And in fact, not only will this be good for you, but this will also be good for your followers. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Shia, because the position of Imam Hussein was because he sacrificed his blood. This is why we received the Shafa'a of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of judgment. And so he tells him, you have to go back. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he wakes up he is crying he does not know what to do and then he remembers that there is one more person he wants to visit before he leaves the city of Medina he wants to go and to visit his dear mother Fatima to Zahra brothers and sisters those of you who have been gone to Medina they know that the the grave of Fatima to Zahra is unknown we do not know where it is we do not know where she was buried Imam Ali alayhi salam in the middle of the night he took Fatima to Zahra and he buried her. We do not know, but Hussein alayhi salam knows where his mother is. Hussein alayhi salam was present on the day in which his mother was killed. Hussein alayhi salam helped his father and family members in order to wash his mother and shroud her and to bury her in the middle of the night. Hussein alayhi salam saw the broken rib of his mother, Fatima to Zahra. So he turns to his mother's grave. He goes towards his mother and he begins to remember remember all of his memories, Allahu Akbar. He begins to remember how he grew up with his mother, but he did not spend a lot of time with her. Fatima was very young when she passed away. And as such, he begins to cry to his mother. And he tells her, my dear mother, if you were only here to see what is going on, Ya Fatima to Zahra, Oh Allah, do not allow any believing mother to witness the death of her son. Allahu Akbar. Oh Fatima, on the night uh, had you been there on Karbala on the day of Ashura to see to witness what had happened oh Fatima I want to tell you something the night that you were killed was very tragic for all of the Shia all of our hearts and all of our ribs were broken when your rib was broken. Oh, Fatima, but that night, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, your compassionate husband, your children, Hussein and Hassan and Zainab and Umm Kulthum and the Mu'mineen, they were with you. They participated.
shrouded in your funeral. They shrouded you. They washed you. They placed you in the dirt. They prayed over your body. But your son Hussein on the day of Ashura in Karbala, he was left decapitated, a, head, a body without a head. His body was trampled by the forces of Yazid. And he was left without washing or shrouding or burial. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين